Are you tired of wasting your time on print-related tickets? Printer Logic offers a centralized, cloud-native, IP-based print management system. Dump your print servers and discover the future of print management with Printer Logic. Find out more and get a free 30-day trial at printerlogic.com slash packet pushers. Hello, I'm Jonna Johnson. I'm the CEO of Nemertes Research, and I'm here with my co-host, Greg Farrow, who is the co-founder of Packet Pushers. And you are listening to Heavy Strategy, where we debate pivotal questions in enterprise IT. And as Greg likes to say, the questions matter a whole heck of a lot more than the answers. So for today, we're going to be talking about the next generation of collaboration technology or technology to enable distributed work. And where we're starting is uh, the basic the basic premise here is when I talk to enterprise organizations about collaboration, they kind of look at me and say, oh, that's that's a solved problem. We have Microsoft Teams. We're good. Uh, and the point of this show is I think Gre- Greg and I agree very strongly that that's the wrong answer. You are not good if you just inv- have teams and aren't thinking further about it. But we may disagree on what some of the things you should be thinking about are. So, Greg, I know you have some strong opinions about about how business processes are going to need to change and business is going to need to change in the not too distant future with distributed work. Yeah, I think the we've talked quite a bit about just. Dist- distributed work or remote work, as other people like to call it. I like to think of it as distributed. So that is work I, I happens. I like that word, yes. Yeah, it's because it, the point is, is that the office is also remote or is going to be the same, right? It's going to be the same location as home. Some people come into an office just because that's convenient for them or they like it or there's some resource there that they need. But the the office or a campus is no different to a coffee shop or working from home or a co-working facility or from a customer's premises, right? So let me let me stop you there quickly because I just want to hammer home this point in case you just had your first cup of coffee and you're listening. Um, I think it's really critical to talk about distributed work and not remote or hybrid work because remote and hybrid both assume that there is a right place for work to be done and a wrong place. And the point about distributed is work gets done where the worker is. Yes, that's right. And one of the things that we have failed to recognize is that a lot of companies out there, their workers are based in other people's premises. So in manufacturing, you have repair services that go from factory to factory or from machine to machine. Or if you run a consulting business, all of your employees are out in the field on customer premises or, you know, working with a, with a client, wherever that may be, that's not remote work. That's distributed work. And that was always with us. What's happened is, this idea of white collar workers working from home that is not coming into an office five days a week um, is the new piece. So the distributed workforce, to my mind, got larger. Now, the challenge here is that a lot of companies don't realize, to my mind, that that is a major transition in business process. So a lot of the lashback. Now, I do want to make one comment. Um, The return to work thing has stalled. So I saw some data this week. Thank you for making that point because people, there was enough press over it and I want to get back to your data, but I just want to highlight there's so much press earlier in the, in the fall. Oh, everybody's Mm. returning to the office and now nobody's saying a word about it. So bring it on, Greg, what are the, what's actually happening? Yeah. So I've got some data here from, from some sources. I won't, you know, if you want go look at my Twitter feed, if you want to see it, because I retweeted it. But what's actually happened is based on data from a company called Castle and from the U.S. Fed, uh, the average occupancy rate for offices in the U.S. is now 30%. So on a five-day working week, they're 30% occupancy levels. Before COVID, the occupancy level was 60 to 70%, and that is now flat for uh, over a year. So the presumption here is that the new going forward is that working from home or this, you know, the the office will only ever work, be. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the uh, distributed work is embedded in the workforce. It is not coming back to pre uh, you know, 60 to 70 percent office utilization as it was prior. Which, in fairness, is something I was saying from the very dawn of COVID is like, get used to it because it's not going back. And I had mm. I'm actually thinking of one client in particular where I was talking to the senior management, you know, the folks, the the uh, company officers. And they said, you know, you're wrong. And it turns out I wasn't wrong. But it, what they wanted me mm. to be wrong because they'd spent millions of dollars on their fancy headquarters. And when I talked to them last Every they said we are not going to be supporting remote work. That's what they called it, remote work mm-hmm. after COVID ends. And when I talked to them last a couple of months ago, one hundred percent of their new employees were distributed work, remote work. You yeah. know, so so yeah, it's it you was can, predictable can, then, but 
it's happened. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, all of those reasons we've actually done a show on this, basically, you mm-hmm. know, the, the biggest challenge for businesses is if you don't support distributed work, you're not going to be hiring employees. You're only going to find a certain type of person who is, you know, within a 30 minute drive of your of your physical location. That's a fairly limited pool of candidates to draw from. Right. And we'll put up with your stupid micromanaging. Yeah. Well, you know, and potentially is the sort of person that will respond to being in an office five days a week, which is potentially not the right sort of person for certain roles. Maybe for some roles it might be, but for others it's not. So with that said, the challenge I think is is that people who have been, you know, doing business and being leaders or being executives or being managers for, you know, decade two or three, is that they haven't yet realized that when you go for distributed work, you have to change the way that you build things because previously the glue that held your teams together was physical location. So, you know, corridor chats, having lunch together, you know, seeing each other in the car park, complaining about the lack of car parking, complaining about the lack of desks in an office, you know, all those sorts of things. And that is team building in the old ways, right, was complaining about stuff like how bad is the coffee, the, you know, the canteen's disgusting, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and and executives were also given a sense of review or visibility or accountability because they could see you, right? They could walk they, up to there, you. There was a name for it. It was called management by walking around. Yeah. So if you're going to go with this distributed work idea, it means you need to look at those processes or understand them or know they exist would be a start. Um, and then you need to think about ways to replace them. So um, let me give you an example. Video meetings are really hard to do. The research is out now showing that being in a video meeting is substantially more tiring over time and harder to maintain attention than a physical meeting. Well, that makes sense, right? Being in a physical meeting, it's really easy to because everybody's, you know, you've got that constant interaction. You've got much more information coming in through your eyes and your ears. But a video call like we're on a video call here right now, right? Very exhausting, very tiring. So what that? So what's the answer to that? Well, the answer isn't to go back to physical meetings. The answer is what can I do to change my Ex- process so that video meetings start to work? Because you Ex- have to come from a presumption that they're a necessity. And I'm, I'm in the background agreeing vehemently in case you heard those little ex, ex, exactly. Um, I want to highlight something because we at Nemertes, uh offer consulting workshops to internalize processes, internalize things for teams to work better, both distributed and in person. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because we do these either in person or over video. But the way we do them over video is not and I think is not the standard way that video is normally used. And I think p- this just backs mm. up what you're saying, Greg, because what we've done is we, we've taken the standard format of a meeting where one person talks, everybody listens, another person talks, everybody listens. And that's that's deadly to do over video. And mm. what we do in our workshops is very, very different. And it's much more interactive in a way that really engages people. But it's a different method of interacting. And you have to recognize that you can't just transport the standard way of a meeting into video meeting. You have to actually yeah. make it much more interactive. So we're able to take, you know, to hold four hour Zoom calls where nobody's multitasking, everybody's engaged and everybody walks away feeling mm-hmm. energized and not tired. So it's doable. And mm-hmm. the point is you have to change how you do things. Let's pause the conversation for a word from sponsor Printer Logic. Remember how the future was going to be paperless? Yeah, not so much. And where there's paper, there's printers and print servers. If you're tired of dealing with print-related tickets, PrinterLogic offers a simple, scalable, cloud-native, centralized, direct IP printing platform. Connect your print environment to easily manage front and back-end printing, integrate with EMR and ERP solutions, and get visibility and security. Say goodbye to print servers and reduce print tickets by up to 90% with PrinterLogic. Find out more and get a free 30-day trial at printerlogic.com slash packetpushers. That's printerlogic.com slash packet pushers. And now back to the podcast. So here's a suggestion just to come up with something practical. Um, one of the things that I've done is it, I, this goes back to the old IBM days when you always had a pre-meeting meeting. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. It was very common to actually have a meeting internally inside of IBM before you to went decide to decide what, what's the point of this meeting. Yes. But to, and to make sure that everybody's saying the same thing actually was the main underlying yeah. thing. So you didn't have you know, the employees, you know, the IBM people fighting amongst themselves or coming up with cross narratives, right? Um, Which, of course, they do, but you just don't show it to the customer. It makes you look good. Um, So one of the things that I 
um, would suggest that you do with this is actually to have uh, chat room collaborations. So you actually go in and have a chat room to discuss the meeting before it gets there. Now, that does require you to actively make a change to your process. Like you've got to say, we're having a meeting on Friday. We're going to discuss some topics. But in order to cut the meeting short, I want to have an early discussion here now so that we can prepare for the meeting and make it effective. Well, and that's you- one way to do it. But mm-hmm. I'm going to push back on that because mm-hmm. I think the the newer way to do it and the better way to do it is what Edward Albee has been promoting. He's the uh, the visual display of quantitative information guy. And if you haven't read him, you <laughs> must, because it's yep. really important. This I, I went to one of his workshops. This is what he does. And I'm told this is what happens at Amazon. You walk in the door, by the way, the door shuts at, you know, if the meeting is at 12 o'clock, the door shuts at 12.01 and you're done. Mm. So you better be on time. They hand out a description of whatever it is that's supposed to be accomplished. Here is the challenge that we are facing. Here's the goal of this meeting. Everybody gets 10 minutes to read it silently, formulate an opinion, make notes. And then there's a structured way to engage, weigh in with their opinions, wrap up come to a conclusion or come to the conclusion that no conclusion is possible and another meeting is required and they walk out in 20 or 30 minutes. But the point is that you, each person is given time to time to focus on what the issue is, private time to come up with their ideas and then public collaborate collaborative time to bounce their ideas off each other. The cool thing is it doesn't require the pre-meeting meeting because you expect to walk in and be confronted with the information that you need, but you also have to have the skills to internalize that information quickly and form an opinion quickly, which is challenging for some people. Hmm. Well, I mean, the main thing is, from my point of view, is however you, you there's two ways to do it. One way is to make the meeting shorter by preparing better, Right. That is, discuss the well, topics to be discussed, but make the decisions on the day. Well, what what I'm recommending, just to be clear, what I'm recommending is that, but instead of taking the entire team to discuss, the person who's hosting the meeting has to think through what the hell is, what the hell do I want from this meeting? Which mm. that's really gets to the point you're getting at, Absolutely. Greg. Too so many pe- people just turn up to a meeting and go, oh, we're having a meeting about it, so let's start the discussion now. And, and I want to and- highlight something because mm. I know this is one of your things, Greg. Yeah. Often the people that do that are the people whose job it is to actually know what the meeting is for, so i.e. senior management. So how many times have you been pulled into a meeting where the person who's holding the meeting doesn't even know what the meeting's about? And it's like, well, I'd like to talk about our server strategy, right? Yeah. And it's like, well, what, what about it, dude? Because I'm busy. I need to go implement some things. What do you want to know? I don't yeah. know. What are you thinking? And it's like, you want to you want to strangle these people because it's like, tell me what it is you want to accomplish. I'll do whatever homework I need to do. Or yeah. give me the information I need to internalize right now, and I'll yeah. give you my feedback. But don't just sit there and like, well, let's talk about this. Yeah. And I mean, that idea of preparing for a meeting isn't new. Right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's been just around good for management. It. It's just been a good thing. But people get away with it because when you go face to face with people, you know, you can get around it and you can sort of recover very quickly and, you know, all that sort of thing. I it, I feel like... If you know when you go into remote work, you have to treat meeting times far more precious and yes. far more expensive than you did before. Because if you try and have extremely long meetings to try and re- like because people aren't there, you're losing the data of face to face. The interaction model where people can speak up from the back of the you know from the juniors and so forth is very different in a Zoom meeting. You have to embrace that and work out how you're going to address it. Does that make? Sense. Yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense. And I really like the fact that you hit on the idea that the time is precious because it's still precious in person. It's just that in person, we basically have been we've been cheating and mm. treating time is free because essentially once you're on once you're on mm. the clock, you're in the office, we base we pretend like your time is worth nothing. And the real issue with distributed work is all of a sudden people are realizing how long it does or doesn't take to get stuff done. And part of the reason that managers are trying to bring people back in the office failing but trying is because they've got egg on their face because something that they swore up and down took, you know, 20 hours a week to do takes two when you focus on it. And somebody yeah. could do that in between three loads of laundry. And now and now it's like, oh, my God, my people are actually having lives instead of spending 20 hours in an office wasting time. And, you know, that kind of thing is is endemic. But I think pro- so. So thing number one is you got to change your processes. But I'm going to switch gears a little bit and say, if you're a technologist thinking that you have the sufficient technology because you're doing Microsoft Teams, 
um, that's not enough on a technology front for a very simple reason, which is very soon collaboration is expanding well beyond the level of any one vendor to deliver all the pieces. Let me give you a here and now real example and then some future thoughts. The here mm. and now real example I was thinking about is DocuSign. I have clients that say they don't have a cloud strategy, and yet all of their workflow processes are built into DocuSign because essentially what they do is they make a decision, somebody has to sign off on it, somebody else has to sign off on it, and all of that workflow is built into DocuSign. And at least at present, Microsoft doesn't own DocuSign. Yeah. Uh, that's a small example, but the point is, if if I were to ask most of my clients, hey, how are you thinking about workflow, the answer would probably be, um, e- either service now if it's an IT shop or DocuSign if it's for business. Well, but, but they would say Microsoft because yeah. Microsoft is sort of their office app. So here are a couple things to think about. First of all, right now, your model of collaboration and distributed work is I have to talk to Greg. That's very soon going to change because Greg hmm. may be an AI. Greg may be a, an, an avatar. Greg may be a bot. And you actually are going to have to figure out how to set up collaboration that seamlessly enables human to human, human to robot, human to AI. And they're two different things because the robot has physical instantiation and the AI does not necessarily. I mean, it could be an AI enabled robot. And oh, by the way, all these things also have to talk to each other. They have to talk to each other in a fashion that's functional, but it also has to be auditable. It has to be manageable. You have to be able to jump in in case you're getting caught in some kind of vortex of, you know, uh, of of spin that you can break the process very quickly so you don't just get you know sucked out to sea by the bots talking to the to the AIs and suddenly you know as as happened or in the early stages of financial firms when all of a sudden automated trading trading got crazy and crashed the yeah. markets hmm. so that all of that is not going to get solved by Microsoft Microsoft may play a part of this and this is not John is bashing Microsoft I think Microsoft's done a tremendous job making sure that it's on top of every single technology transition in the past 30, 40 years. But it's not going to be the end all and be all for collaboration in the future that it is at this exact moment in 2023. So you're going to have to start thinking about what other tools you need and how they integrate with other entities, because the entity explosion is just happening. Yeah, I agree. I think and this idea that chatbots are going to replace people, um, so you know, where before you would contact HR about questions, I think AI driven, though we probably won't call them chatbots because chatbots weren't very successful. No, and exactly. It's <laughs> a bit like cryptocurrency at this point. It's, uh, you know, <laughs> NFTs. <laughs> yes, the brand exactly. damage is pretty substantial. Um, but, you know, when you submit a question to HR for most queries, you might actually get some sort of an AI LLM with a custom database behind it responding and that database. So the idea of interaction will change in the long term to less and less person to person to person to bot or person to AI, you know, assistant type thing. And in fact, you may, if you want to get right out there on the weird fringe of AI, you know, uh, worship, you may actually have an AI assistant so that people can ask you questions and say like, are you available on Thursday at two? And the AI assistant will respond back and go, no. Now, of course, the person could look at a calendar, but how many people send you an email instead of looking at your calendar? So, Well, there is that, and it's called Calendly, and it doesn't need to be very intelligent. It doesn't actually need AI, um, but that's actually a key point. You know, Microsoft is slowly embedding this into its calendaring, but Calendly invented it. And I think... The thing that you're going to see from a technology perspective is the growth in, and I don't want to call them cloud applications because obviously Teams is and and Microsoft 365 is a cloud application, Mm -hmm. but because because these solutions can get built and offered as cloud services, software as a service, they're going to happen faster outside of Microsoft. So I'm I'm saying I keep hitting on Microsoft for a reason because I've seen so many enterprises say. Collaboration is a solved problem. I do Microsoft plus one or two add-on apps like, say, DocuSign for a specific purpose that Microsoft doesn't do. And what I'm Mm. trying to tell you is with what Greg is talking about, distributed work becoming the norm, and what I'm talking about with this entity explosion, 
you are going to actually those those add on bolt on things are actually going to become the majority of your collaboration in the next couple of years. So it's going to yes. flip instead of being yeah. Microsoft plus it will be plus and also Microsoft. And that's a very different strategy because now you have to start thinking about ecosystems as opposed to the big rock strategy. I mean, the big rock mm. is easy. Whatever Microsoft mm. does, you do it. And when they roll out the next version, you adopt it and you're done. Um, mm. With the ecosystem, you're constantly adding new products to your portfolio, pruning out, I hope you're pruning out, products yeah. that have been obsoleted and always assessing how these things work together, how well they work together. And con mm. it becomes kind of a rolling yeah. thunder approach instead of a once and done approach. Right. So let me give you an example of how you do that, right? Um, the tools that you use to track white collar work progress, so projects, um, work streams, you know, all that sort of stuff. A lot of the time today, people use Microsoft Project, but Microsoft Project really doesn't work. It needs to be online in a web browser, but just having a Gantt chart isn't enough, right? You actually need a web-based project management tool and Microsoft Project isn't it. And so now you start looking at uh, Kanbans and, you know, workflow boards, and then you start looking at other tools like Monday.com or tools like that, where you actually have programmable workflow type activities going on. Well, and, and I'll take that. I'll, I'll take that to a new extreme. Mm -hmm. So essentially, I break the collaboration space into the traditional voice and video. So Teams, Zoom, uh, Slack is adding video now. Chat, which people most people think is is Slack, but can also be Teams or Zoom or River. Uh, mm -hmm. Then you get into information organization and sharing, and that's where you get things like Asana, which is also task and project management. Box and Dropbox are building a lot of workflow. And, of course, those of us in the programming space are using GitHub. Uh, and Notion is actually very, very big there. As you start to transition into tra task and project management with workflow, yes, Teams is there, but you've got Asana, Monday, Airtable, Trello, Miro, uh, and also GitHub. Then, mm. and this becomes really important design and particularly visual design. I mentioned Edward Albee. Um, we have historically neglected visual design of information because we always figured, you know, here, why, why, why isn't an Excel sheet what everybody needs? But there are products out there that will enable design, take, take that information and display it. And people mm. call it dashboarding sometimes because in that, in that, that's a specific instance of well-designed information. Airtable does some of that. Asana does some of that. Notion is actually very strong there. And then mm -hmm. you segue into things like community interaction, which allows you to get value, meaningful input from large yeah. groups. And that's again where Miro looks good. Yeah. Um, GitHub does a fabulous job. Yeah. It's essentially now, the Reddit approach. So for me, you've got to go a step further than these tools. Like if you're going to store files in oh, Dropbox absolutely. or Box or whatever, and if you're going to use a project management tool for here, there are tools that move beyond that. So I'm thinking of tools like Make or Zapier, which yep. are event driven and workflow oriented. And, you know, if a customer sends you a file, they drop it into Dropbox because, you know, whatever, that's a community type thing. Um, then all of a sudden an automation kicks in that brings the file up makes an archive copy of the original so that it's always stored away, puts it into a location for, you know, whatever, then yep. uploads it to Slack channel so that everybody can see that it was suddenly added to the project, goes off to a project management tool. I don't know, whatever, whatever, my, probably, there's so many of Google them now. Google Drive or anything. But yes, as yeah. a matter of fact, we use Zapier fa fairly extensively. Um, mm. If you don't know what it is, it's a, it's, automated work cloud to cloud workflow. So for example, if you sign up to join our community, what happens is you you fill out the form, Zapier mm -hmm. lets us know that it it's there and then the process behind the scenes kicks off and we're off and running. Yeah. And so, there are others. There's sequential Zapier is now being replaced by Make and so mm -hmm. on. And of course Zapier exactly. was a replacement for IFTTT and et cetera, et cetera. So that whole market involves the whole point is it's there and it's well beyond Microsoft. So But I mean what I'm saying here yeah. is that there are tools that stitch together tools. Exactly. Exactly. So if you're going to do distributed work, it has to happen and this is a foundational idea, is it has to happen asynchronously. So before people would say, I'll have that for you by two o'clock. Well if you're working in different time zones or if you're time shifting because you're a you know, you're a single dad and you've got to go and pick up your kids from school. Uh, you've got to leave home at two to pick them up at 2.30, you know, whatever, right? Then you need these automations to create alerts. So if the file arrives 
you should have that automated so that the file gets flagged in all the right places. Okay. So distributed work is changing. Come back to what I said before about changing your practices. You have to be in a situation where you're saying, okay, that's great. Um, if, if I'm going to work to everybody not being in the same room and phone calls don't work, let's just say that for a point, you know, phone calls do not work anymore. People don't answer phones. They don't want to talk to you by voice. They're, you know, or if they do, it's going to be in a, you know, I'm a big fan of having face muted conversations. That is sure. I'll be on Zoom, but I don't want to show my face. I just want to listen to you. But it doesn't mean a quick phone call for five minutes to say, hey, hey, Jonah, that file's just arrived. Can you can you do the do with it? That's not acceptable anymore. Well, but that was it, acceptable 10 years ago. Exactly. And so I think, you know, you mentioned the concept of foundational ideas. I think, you know, listening to this, I hope you're coming away with the foundational idea is regardless of what your managers are telling you, distributed work is here to stay. So you might as well engineer and and strategize for it because regardless of what they tell you, it's mm. here. The second yeah. thing is the the single the idea of a single vendor, whether it's Microsoft or Zoom or Slack or I don't care who it mm. is, giving you everything you need is it, it is dead on arrival. Don't even go there. Think in yeah. terms of ecosystems. Think in terms of what you need today and what you're going to need as you in, increase the number of machines and bots and AIs in your organization. And mm-hmm. the lot and you know, sort of the the last one is the the point that you made, Greg. Tools that integrate tools is going to be a big piece of what you're doing. Big piece, and it, yeah. And and now that used to be Excel. That used right. to be Microsoft Project. People who could drive Excel or drive Microsoft Project. Yes. were offering an advantage to the business. Well, those tools are now obsolete in the distributed work environment. You I can't wouldn't say they're sh- obsolete, but I'd say mm. for the purpose that they've been used, you know, yes. yeah, you you can use Excel, but why would you do that when you could use Maker's Apier and have it automated and have yes, your right. job simply to and, jump, to jump mm. in and sign off on the process as opposed to implement the process? Okay. Now, one more thing I want to touch on just before we wrap. Human yes. resources, right? Yes. We have to change... There has to be, and this is more for the people who are listening. If you're being managed by a by somebody, the the way that your leadership or your managers or your you know who you report to, the way they monitor your performance and the way that they monitor business performance has to change. So, you know, employ as we talked before, and we hinted about it at the start. You know, manager performance monitoring used to be oh walk around and see who's in, see what they're doing you know, whatever. Well, that has to change to be a much different approach. It has to be, you know, you're going to still have your one-on-one reviews and maybe they happen a bit more often so that the manager has more of a sense who you are, but you've got to have some sort of tooling to say this performance, this person is conducting this many activities because if it drops to zero, how do you know, right? If you're going to talk about- And even more to the point, you should focus less and less on which activities they're conducting and whether the output is happening and That's only right. dig into, hey, are you doing the right steps to generate the output if the output is failing? You know, if that person yep. is somehow magically generating that po- report every morning at nine o'clock, you don't really care whether he or she is spending the rest of the day, you know, shooting pool or sunning themselves <laughs> if that report is coming in and that's well, what you need them to do. A certain type of executive would regard that as it's cheating, but yes. I'm not giving them enough work rather than well, yes. they're getting the but. work done efficiently. So I, I, one other thing that if you're going to, this is why we hear a lot of talk about business dashboards and data analysis, because mm-hmm. that supports this. So if you're right. going to start talking about monitoring business performance and monitoring employee performance, you'll see a lot of verbiage in the press or from vendors about business dashboards. And that's what you're looking at here, Right. Is there enough product going out the door? Is it what's the work performance of a division? If you're in IT, it's pretty hard to measure your outputs, but you have to find something that's going to measure employee contribution. So there's that. And the last one is onboarding. And this is the one I don't think gets talked about enough. If you're going to go and hire people who work remote, yes, it's on them to integrate with the company, but it's also on you, especially for young people. So, you know, the Gen Zs, the millennials, not the Gen Zs, the millennials, who may not have experience. Oh, no, the Gen Zs also. It's it's 2023, Greg. Gen Zs are 23 years old now. Mm. So you're sort of talking about it's not enough just to sit them on the deck and say, here's your buddy, ask your buddy questions (laughs) and they'll help you. (laughs) Right. You know, know, or so-and-so is going to be your mentor while you get up to speed. And then the, the executive disappears off into the distance to go and play golf or, you know, 
hide off in an office somewhere, which is what used to happen. And then some, that you could always just walk around and ask for help and somebody would be there to ask for help. So you actually now have to be in a process where onboarding has to be radically changed. People have to be introduced. People have to have social events to learn who everybody is. Absolutely. Some of them are virtual. You know, maybe you get together and have coffee at 11 o'clock every morning for 15 minutes and everybody chats, something like that. You have to have time-consuming, structured activities that focus on interaction between people who are new to the business. Well, so that- and I would I would also stress having run a virtual company for over 20 years, that, that, that social interaction is one of the few things that is really done best uh, in person. So hmm. this comes back to if you still have office space, rip out all the desks, chuck all the <laughs> hoteling, turn it into a party room, invite everybody over for a once in a once a month get together, fly people in, oh, you know, once or twice a year, have mm-hmm. people hang out in person together. You can it turns out that you you can build on that interaction for hmm. anywhere from three to six months before it needs to be refreshed with another in-person interaction. I'm yeah, I'm not that person. I, I tend to more towards the once a quarter at most. Oh, and that's why I said three flying, to six. You can do two a yeah. year and get away with yeah. it. But if you've just onboarded a whole bunch of people, right. don't get stuck in a routine. Be flexible right. about this and say, hang on, I've just onboarded 20% of my team in the last three months. Let's call one. Let's have it now, Right be aware of what's happening. Don't sit there and say, oh, that's not scheduled for six months or, right. you know, whatever. Right. Say, Guys, we have to, something's happening with the energy in this group. Let's uh-huh. pull everyone together. And the, that, I just want to, I, I want to back up something because Greg, you sparked a thought. Hmm. I think uh, managers have to rethink the whole concept of productivity because we've got very much of a 19th century model of productivity, both in in the business and also in our own heads. It's like if I have eight hours a day, that means I have eight productive hours. Listen, yeah. we're all human beings. We know damn well that's not the case. You might yeah. have three super productive hours in the morning or at night, whatever your personal schedule is. And the rest of the time you're shuffling papers and smiling at people and, and checking boxes off. And the, and, the, and the challenge is for you and for your manager to figure out what energizes you, put more yeah. of that in your work day, what gives you respite and relief and put enough of that in there so that you can't possibly maintain a high energy, you know, 24 seven people fool themselves that they can, but they can't really. And so you start when you start having this conversation about what energizes your employees, it sounds very woo woo. But just yesterday, I was actually coaching a CIO. And he has an enormously talented lieutenant who's, you know, quite brilliant. I've met the lieutenant. The problem was the lieutenant was doing every job except the most important job that the CIO had given him. And my question was, find out why his energy is blocked. And I know that sounds like incense and candles, but it's actually real because this guy can generate energy for all the other things in his life. So why not this? There's something more. So coming back to what you were saying, Greg, you have to be able to use these tools to literally sense the energy of your team and see when it's going south. Yeah. And that's, and and, and that is much more challenging for executives, but mm-hmm. it's also much more challenging for employees to go to them, yes. go to your executive and say, Hey, 20% of our staff have come on board in the last six weeks. We sh- it's time to get together. And person. yeah, well, it's not just, it's just what I'm saying is not just the numbers. It's not just 20% of our ta- staff has come on board. 20% of our staff has come on board. Yeah. And well, I so am whatever pick- the number is. You know, well, no, maybe. but I am picking up above and beyond the number. I am yeah. picking up a sense of confusion. There's low energy. I'm not yeah. sure why we should connect and talk openly about why we aren't able to do our work and, mm. and, and address it. So it's not just the numbers, 20% or 30% or whatever it is. It's also that sense of, Hey, are they, do they have the right energy and is that that energy becoming productive? And mm. those are harder questions to answer because you can't just do a, an energy no. level dashboard. Yes. So Although you might be able to what do have that we talked with AI. About here? What do we, we've yeah. talked about that the, the, the distributed work is here to stay. It's not, you know, offices are only 30% utilized and it's only a matter of time until companies realize that that's not changing and they start downsizing their offices and make distributed work the normal. Exceptions apply. We talked about... How do you build better teams? We talked about looking at your business process, which obviously, but you support your business process with technology. You've got to understand that video meetings don't work. You've got to work around them. You need new tools to support your processes. And there are new tools here. So lots of startups, lots of innovation in that space. Well, not innovation, but lots of um, emergent 
capability uh, companies emerging into the technology sets that are far ahead of where Microsoft or any of the brand vendors are in they stitch together um, third party products. So if you want to stitch together Microsoft and Dropbox and Zoom and Monday and Salesforce, you don't need to go and write custom tools. You can actually use third party. And then the final one is how you engage with human resources needs to change as well. There's more, but that's enough for today in this half hour, Jonah. Okay, well, thank you for joining us today. If you've got feedback or a follow-up on this topic, as Greg always says, send us a message at packetpushers.net, F-U, which stands for cough, cough, follow-up. We'd love to hear from you about your thoughts, good or bad. Also note that we are we love heavy strategies. This is us. But at PackerPushers.net, you'll find the Network Break podcast, which helps you stay current on the latest tech news and what it means. So check out all the other podcasts that you'll find there. There's a whole lot more tech networking podcasts or newsletters, uh, a job board where you can find fantastic engineers for roles you're trying to fill. Just a great place to hang out. If you want to hang out with me, please come and join me and my colleagues at Nemertes at the community at Nemertes.com. Hit up the site. Fill out the form and you'll join the community where Greg also hangs out and we chat about these things. And we look forward to hearing from you.